All right, welcome. We're going to discuss a series series, series feedback configuration known as the transconductance amplifier. Now, we looked at an example with discrete transistors, a pure voltage amplifier. We fed back a voltage um, to sum into an input, uh, so our gain was just in volts per volt. Now, a transconductance amplifier is a little bit different. A transconductance amplifier samples an output current, generates a voltage in proportion to that output current, and then subtracts that from some input control signal. So I'm going to zoom in on this slide and take a look at an example of a transconductance amplifier configuration. Now, I can see here we have an op amp driving an NPN transistor. We have a load connected at the emitter. And then in series with that load is a resistor, R sub E. And that's our sampling resistor. Now, the way we can analyze the circuit is if we apply some voltage V in, it's going to drive a current into the base of that transistor, which is going to generate a current I out through RL. There is some gain in the op amp, and then there is current gain. There is current gain in the transistor. We won't worry about what that is for now. We just know that it's there. Because we're using an output, um, excuse me, because we are using an op amp, most of the current, if not all, is going to flow through that sampling resistor RE. The reason is, is that the inverting input of that op amp is going to have very little current, very little current flowing into that terminal because most of these op uh, amplifiers, operational amplifiers, have a really high input impedance. So, Knowing that, we, we have a system where our output current has to flow through this emitter, or excuse me, R sub E, and we develop a feedback voltage, VFB, that is proportional to the amount of current flowing through the load. Now, in this case, the load doesn't have to be a resistor. It could be whatever we want, maybe some sort of light, um, some sort of device we want to control a current through, but we want to control that current with a nice uh, voltage signal. Maybe that voltage signal is from a microprocessor, a function generator, um, or something similar. So we can think about what this op amp is going to do, is we know when we have sufficiently high gain for an op amp, it's always trying to make these terminals equal. And because of that, we can use a little intuition that whatever voltage we apply here, and let's say we apply 5 volts here, that means the op amp is going to keep moving its output until the input to the inverting inputs at 5 volts, meaning we have 5 volts here. Well, if we know RE, we can just take 5 volts divided by RE and figure out what that output current is, and then this transistor becomes a buffer. It allows us to drive a lot more current than the op amp would allow. So that's one way of looking at this circuit. There's many ways, but that's just one. If we consider the ideal model of a transconductance amplifier, which is a series series amplifier, we call it a series series because we need to sample a current. And to sample a current, we need to have some sort of circuit that we put in series with whatever our load is. Now, in this case, we don't really have a load drawn, but there could be something here. The important part to recognize is that we sample a current but we have this dependent source that generates 
a feedback voltage in proportion to the amount of current. Now we're sampling with a resistor. We could replace that resistor with something else as long as it provides some sense of the output current. Ideally, we don't want that component to disturb the output circuit, but because we have feedback, as long as we have re that relation where we can generate an output voltage in proportion to, um, excuse me, we can generate a feedback voltage in proportion to the output current, we're good. Now in this, it's a series series because we take that proportional voltage and we put it in series with the input circuit. And that has the effect of subtraction. Now let me just scoot over here a little bit. Our beta network in this case, beta sub z, we always define this beta terms as our, some feedback voltage over an output. Well, in this case, it's v, VFB, our voltage feedback divided by our output. And it's important to recognize that that's volts and that's amps. So the unit of this feedback term is ohms because it's volts per amp. In a pure voltage amplifier or a pure current amplifier, we don't have that case. We, they're unitless because the top and bottom unit are the same. But sometimes it's a little weird to think about these feedback and feed forward gains in terms of units of ohms, but that's just the way it works out. Now we can write what this actually is in terms of our components because VFB is simply I out times RE and I out is what it is. So we end up with our beta network is RE. It's just RE. Now, our transconductance amplifier is the combination of that uh, NPN transistor and that op amp. And we identify our transconductance gain as just our output current divided by the error voltage, the voltage that's presented to the op amp. Now for this op amp, we're just gonna say it has super high gain. That'll make the analysis easier and that's not a bad assumption for an op amp. Now our forward gain, A sub G, right? This has the units of amps per volt. So the unit is a semen or uh, inverse ohm. So it's a little weird to think that way, but that's just the way it works out. Now using our feedback equation, our classic feedback equation we looked at before, we can plug things in. And remember that if our forward gain is large, which in this case, that's a reasonable expectation, that our closed loop gain is just one over the beta network. And so our closed loop gain is one over RE. Now, if we plug this into a relation that we know that our output current is our closed loop gain times our input, we can have a relation that if we simply have our input voltage divided by RE, we get our output current. And that kind of makes sense with how we started this uh, discussion, where if I was to put some voltage, and I said five volts, the op amp's gonna wanna force these terminals to be equal. We have five volts. To figure out that current, it's five volts divided by RE, or VN divided by RE is our output. And that's how that works. Now let's talk about the complete opposite of a transconductance amplifier. His, his complete opposite is a trans resistance amplifier. Because remember, one over conductance is resistance. And the idea of a trans resistance amplifier is an amplifier that accepts some sort of input current and generates an output voltage. So it takes a current and generates an output voltage in some proportion, some gain. Now, there are lots of things that you might need uh, this type of circuit for. So for example, a good example 
is a photodiode. So a photodiode is a good example of a, a component that as light hits it, a current is induced, and you need to be able to convert that current into some proportional voltage. Uh, the currents are going to be really small, so we need some gain. So a photodiode amplifier is a, a pretty common uh, use for a trans-resistance amplifier. We also call it a current two-voltage converter because that's what it is. And we're going to take a look at the op-amp case of a current-to-voltage converter. You may have seen this before, but we're going to look at this uh, from the perspective of this ideal feedback system. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to zoom in on this circuit, and we're going to think about for a minute this input current. Just imagine that we have some sort of current source over here. Let me draw him in here. We have something that is a current source, and it can have some sort of, you know, output impedance itself. An op amp is really nice in that from a, from the perspective of a current to, to voltage converter is we know that very little current is going to flow into that inverting input. And so in this case, II and I feedback are essentially the same current because for us to get zero volts from the inverting the non-inverting input, that has to be true. And so what happens is we can say that our feedback current is what is flowing through R2. Now, a trans-resistance amplifier what it has to do is sample an output voltage and generate a current, a shunted current, that is proportional to the output voltage. And this may be a little bit hard to see from the ideal model to the op amp, but for a trans-resistance amplifier, if we're going to feed back a proportional current, the idea is that because we have a current coming in, to provide our negative feedback, we have to shunt away a little bit of current right here. And it's some proportion of our input current. And that's what we use to provide this feedback control system. Our error current is whatever is left over. You know, it's whatever is left over from that shunt. Now let's step through some of the parameters. Beta, beta sub g, is units of conductance because we have a, our feedback term is a current and our output is a voltage. That's a unit of conductance. Now as stated before, that if we have a high enough gain, that difference in voltage from between the inverting and non-inverting uh, sides of the, in, uh, between the non-inverting and inverting inputs, it's going to be driven to zero. Now, knowing that, what we can do is just say we have zero volts right there. So from the perspective of the current source that's driving this, that is the potential that, that you're going to see. Now, when we write our beta and our I feedback, we can just write it like so. IFB, the current flowing through R2, is just zero because that's what we have at the non-inverting input minus our output. Now we draw it in that way because that is the polarity, that's the direction that that current is flowing. So in the case of uh, 
I feedback, we can just write it as V out over R2, negative V out over R2. Now, moving forward to actually calculate our beta, our V outs cancel, and we're left with our beta is negative 1 over R2, amps per volt in the units of Siemens. Now, once again, our closed loop gain is just 1 over our beta network. And we, we can say that because our forward gain, our open loop gain, is really, really large. And our forward gain, because it's a trans-resistance amplifier, has the units of ohms. And it's negative. So, and it just works out to be negative just because of the zero volt sits on that inverting input and we have zero here and V out here and that's the way we draw it. Now, the important thing because of that is that when we re write a relation of what our output voltage is with respect to our input, we're just left with this inverting term here. So the beautiful part is we can s simply, if we have a current source, maybe it's a photodiode, maybe it's not, we can simply scale him by the value of R2 to generate a nice healthy voltage. And the beautiful part is that whatever's on this side sees pretty close to an ideal voltage source. And whatever's on this side sees an input that's easy to pretty easy to drive. Now, the input impedance, we can use our formulas we developed before, is we simply take the input impedance, um, Ri, and divide it by the amount of feedback, which is 1 plus the loop gain. And if we can drive our forward gain high enough, we can set our input impedance to zero ohms, which is ideal for a current source, right? That current source, if, if we have an input impedance that that current source is having to drive that is pretty close to zero ohms, that current source has to develop very little voltage to make that current flow. And it loads that current source in a very minimal way, which is a very good thing. One last point I'd like to make about this transconductance amplifier, and maybe I'll explain it a little bit different way, is, and, and this can be a little bit confusing, and let me get rid of some of my notes here, is that if this op amp is going to force the inverting input to zero volts, and we know that that error current is going to be very, very small flowing into there, we don't want to sample, we don't want to uh, have a lot of current flowing in there. The only way that we can have current flowing here is that V out has to sit at a lower potential than zero volts. I'll say that one more time. The only way we can get that IFB or that current flowing through R2 to flow in the direction as shown is that V out has to be at a lower potential than ground or our zero volts. And that's the other reason we end up with this negative sign here, is that we have to end up with a negative VO or something that is below our zero volt potential for that current to, to flow. Now, it is possible to build a trans resistance amplifier or the shunt shunt configuration with a discrete transistor. And we'll step through uh, an example of how we can do that. Now I'm going to zoom in on this transistor circuit as well as a small signal model and then we'll come back and take a look at the analysis. But the first thing I want to do is just talk a little bit about this circuit and talk through it a little bit. Now we're going to start at the input here. We can see we have, we're driven by a VI with a fairly high source impedance. A, you know, 10K is fairly high. And that might be 
some sort of sensor that does produce some sort of voltage with in proportion to you know some other physical variable but we have this source impedance in the way well when we analyze this this is kind of a weird case because an ideal voltage source should have zero output impedance um, and if it's a current source it should have a pretty high output impedance so one thing we can do is think about if any voltage source with an output resistance, right, we can do a source transform. To get our Norton equivalent. And in this case, we end up with a constant current source VI over RS. And our output impedance just becomes 10K. That's just the to do a Norton transform. And in this model, that might make a little more sense to rethink of this particular source. Instead of being an ideal voltage source, it's a current source with some uh, output impedance. And like I said, that could be some sort of circuit where it does generate a small current um, with respect to you know, some physical variable like a photodiode. Now, in this circuit configuration, we've seen this before. And if you can imagine for a minute, we'll remove this, these two parts here, is that we just have a common emitter amplifier and we have a bypass cap to improve the gain. And it's something we've seen before. And we can do the analysis of this amplifier without that feedback resistor. We can figure it out. Now in this case, to, to make the analysis um, a little easier, these bypass caps and this coupling cap is pretty important here. We draw him as an infinite value. And what that's really saying is we're gonna make him large enough that the DC condition here doesn't disturb the DC condition here. But it's effectively a short circuit at the frequencies of interest at the midband. Now that resistance presents kind of a challenge. We can think about some amount of current. We have an IB. IB is our base current driving to that transistor. And if we didn't have that feedback resistor, we could do the small signal analysis of figuring out, you know, what is IB to do our problem. Because we have that resistor, we have some current that gets shunted away from the base and fed to our output. And because some of the current gets shunted away, that is our negative feedback. That is our current feedback path. Now to make this problem a little bit easier, we're gonna do exactly what we did with the voltage amplifier and effectively what we did when we were discussing the Miller effect. What we wanna to try to do is come up with a way of analyzing the circuit that we can get rid of this feedback term and replace it with two resistors or two impedances. and we'll call them R prime and R double prime. With the idea being is that we can decouple the output circuit from the input circuit. And if we simply figure out what those are, you know, what are those output resistances? I'm sorry, not output resistances, those equivalent resistances or impedances, it makes the analysis a whole lot easier. Um, and so this is what we did when we looked at the Miller effect and we did this for the voltage amplifier as well. So we, we can do that here for this trans resistance amplifier. Now let me scoot over here. And try to get this all on one page. 
Let's start by identifying our beta network. So our beta network is just our feedback current divided by our output voltage. Well, in this case, what is the feedback current, IFB? Well, we're going to say it's V pi minus the output voltage. Now, let me go over here. We always know we have this V pi across there because we're dry, we're considering the AC model RE is shorted so that's it that is that voltage at that base it is V pi now our other voltage is V out which is right here so if we want to subtract the base voltage or if we want to figure out what that voltage is across RF, because we need to know that to get our feedback current, it's just V pi minus V out. Now, one approximation we can do is that we know V pi is small, and if we have significant gain, uh, V out is not. We can effectively say he, he's zero and write our feedback as simply our feedback current as V out over that feedback resistor. So in this case, if we use that relation, we can approximate our beta network as just 1 over RF amps per volt, or negative 1 over RF Siemens. Now, to do the rest of the problem, what we want to do is be able to find, uh, to break the feedback loop and find the open loop gain. So to do this, here's what we're going to do. Is that we're going to disconnect RF and account for any loading effects. Now, when we write R prime, we'll look at the left-hand side of the small signal model, we can see that if we're R prime is RF plus RC. If we don't think about the feedback, but just kind of look forward there, standing on the, the, the side of R prime, that's what it is. And then the opposite is true. Our double prime, if we're standing here and looking that way, we can sum RF with all of those resistors in the base circuit and come up with a number. Now, when we analyze the model, and I should have probably done this, when we analyze the model, we break the feedback loop and then add R prime and R double prime to the model. So in this case, V out is just our dependent source as always, minus GMV pi times RC in parallel with R prime, or R, R double prime. And that R double prime represents all of that loading of that beta network on that feedback, this, on the other side of that feedback resistor. And so we can come up with a relation. Now in this case, we can also write V pi, because our output is written in terms of V pi, we can write V pi in terms of our input current because it's a trans resistance amplifier, that's important. But we have this R prime to put in parallel with everything else at the base to come up with a relation. And then here we got it. Once we do that, 
we can then write our output in terms of our input. And the beautiful part is because we wrote everything in terms of v pi, is that they cancel and we can end up with a number. And in this case, we get a gain of negative 337k ohms. And it's k ohms only because that gain, that's, that's what the units work out to. We have an output voltage over an input current. In all these circuits, um, once you have A and beta, you can figure out the loop gain. And once you have the loop gain, you get this amount of feedback. And that makes everything about this circuit analysis much easier. And the key is, is just finding those for a particular circuit. So in this case, we can figure out what is the closed loop gain, um, A sub F. Because we have numbers for these terms, we can figure out what it is. And in this case, this, this gain in terms of a trans resistance of a current to a voltage, we end up with this negative 65.9 K ohms, which sounds kind of weird. Now, trans resistance amplifiers, we, we looked at it in terms of, you know, an input current mapping to an output voltage, but any source can be transformed from one to another. We can take that current source and rethink of it as a voltage source. So we can think of this as a voltage amplifier with a voltage gain. And so in that case, we can say V out is just our gain times the input current. The input current is I in times RS. Simple as that. Then when we write V out over V in, we can get a scaled a scale factor of RS to scale our closed loop gain to get a voltage gain. In this case, the voltage gain is, is, is kind of small. And this is probably one of the more confusing aspects of, of when we think about trans resistance and transconductance amplifiers. If we were to take a scope and, and probe the input or output, whether it's a current source driving it or not, we can measure a voltage there and we can measure a voltage at the output to find a, a voltage gain. Likewise, we could measure a current input and output. The really discerning factor is the way and how you choose to analyze the circuit based upon what the source is. In this case, we had a kind of a source that wasn't a great voltage source because it had a fairly high output impedance. So it made sense to think of it, to, to think of it as a, current source with a parallel impedance. Now, all those other parameters like input impedance and output impedance, once again, once we have our amount of feedback term, it's pretty simple. The only thing you have to do is identify the open loop input resistance. And in this case, it's R pi in parallel with R prime because we're looking right here. And likewise, you have to identify what this output resistance is. And it's just R double prime in parallel with our collector resistor. In this case, this, this amplifier, uh, it makes sense to think of it as trans resistance because its input impedance isn't zero. It's not, it's not zero. It's not infinite. Likewise, our output impedance isn't that, isn't superb to think of it in terms of a, you know, pure voltage source or pure current source. Now, one thing you can do is now that we've done that is look at circuits that may be a little bit more complicated, but if you can identify a few mechanisms in the circuit, you can have a pretty good idea of how what their maybe closed loop gain is. And in, in this case, this is a 
uh, a receiver for a Sony surround sound system. And if you looked at this long enough, you could identify a class AB power stage in this node here, which is its output. And then you could follow it back to see where it goes. And in this case, whoever drew the schematic drew it in such a way that we can move back to the left and we can identify a beta network. We can see R663 um, as that series resistor and we have R662 in parallel. And that's our beta network. Now, we just have to make the assumption that looking in here is a fairly high input impedance. And we're going to see in a, several lectures ahead that this differential amplifier, the way it's biased, that's not a bad assumption. We did it for our voltage triple, you know, so, you know, several lectures ago, and we found out we only had a few percent error making that assumption. So in this case, if we were to look at our beta network, we could write our feedback voltage as VO times that network of R662 and R663, which just form a voltage divider. And by doing that, we can work out what our beta is. Now, we're kind of, the other assumption we're doing is we can see a little capacitor in here. We, we're considering this at mid-band, right? So we're going to short that out. And then we can come up with this feedback term, our beta network, and come up with an approximation of our closed loop gain. Now, the other thing that we can look at this circuit and ascertain is that because we had this guy right here, if we look at DC, all we're left with is R663, which means we have something like this, which is just a voltage follower. So our beta, our feedback at DC is 100%. It's 1. And so our closed loop gain at DC is 1. Because at DC, for an audio amplifier, we don't care. Um, we, we only we need to amplify things that are changing. So if you do enough of these, you can get pretty good at looking at a circuit and identifying feedback. And one of the telltale things of uh, I, analyzing the circuit is that if it's a voltage feedback, it's a pretty good assumption to make that whoever designed the circuit at that summing node is that it's a fairly high input impedance. That way you have minimal loading on that beta network. Now a poor design would load that beta network quite a bit and would be a lot harder to do, but a good design makes it so that beta network isn't loaded. That way it's a lot easier to do the analysis.